today about the information revolution. Uh, Andrew is a 20-year veteran of uh, multilingual information development and he has a very global view of the world. So as you can see, it pervades everything he, uh, he speaks about and works on. Um, Acrolinks, as you may know, is a company that focuses heavily on optimizing content for translation um, and making content global ready. And uh, where we are today and where we're going um, for in the future. So um, welcome, Andrew. Uh, take it away, and we'll have some time at the end for Q&A. Oh, one more thing. Uh, Andrew and I have known each other partly through our collaboration with the, uh, on the Translators Without Borders, which has a table out front if you want more information about that. So uh, it's a fantastic organization as well. Does that work? Everyone hear me okay? Sven? Yeah. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, thank you Nick, about the information revolution. I didn't think up this title. Uh, it was put on my presentation by someone from our marketing team, but I, I got to like it. Um, you know, what is what do I what is this information revolution? It sounds very dramatic. Um, I'm going to try and convince you that this really is a revolution that we're in the middle of. And uh, there are some things going on which are, uh, like in all revolutions, a uh, little bit scary, but a huge opportunity. And um, so I'm going to walk you through some of the things that we're doing uh, with our customers, some of the things our customers are asking us to do that we're not yet doing, but would like to be doing, um, and, and talk a little bit about how things uh, are developing from our perspective. Um, Take you back to 1968, uh, my first day at school. This wasn't my first day at school, but there were lots of revolutions going on in 1968. Uh, people, revolutions in costumes. Uh, you probably can't see this. I don't know why all these photos are black and white. I don't, they had color <laughs> photos back then, I think, but uh, I couldn't find any. Um, but um, there was a lot of things changing in 1968. Uh, French were learning to throw stones at policemen, and um, a lot of revolutionary thoughts were going on. Also back in 1968, um, a man called Doug Engelbart, who ended up doing some other groundbreaking stuff in the world of computing, uh, wrote a seminal paper about um, uh, the way that companies talk to each other and talk amongst themselves. He didn't call it enterprise knowledge, he called it uh, corporate, uh, hold on, enterprise IQ, um, in the sense of information, uh, sorry, intelligence quotient, not information quality, but I'll come back to that in a second. So this is what his view of in 1968 was of what knowledge looks like in a manufacturing organization. And I was struck by how applicable some of this was even now. You probably can't see much of that at the back, but it basically says there's management, there's customers, there's marketing, there's uh, engineering, uh, there are suppliers, there's, there's, there's all sorts of stuff going on. There's, there's knowledge in the company, a network of knowledge. In addition to this network of knowledge, there's an external environment going on. This is 1968. Just keep saying that. This is, there's an external environment going on where the organizational units will acquire knowledge somehow. <coughs> They'll ingest knowledge, as he said, um, and uh, from this external environment, and they'll need to pull that in and make it part of their knowledge. And he developed a process that he thought would be a, a collaborative, dynamic, continuous process. We were warned away from buzzwords this morning, but um, these are buzzwords that, uh, that are incredibly current right now. So he's 
trying to talk about a con collaborative, dynamic, continuous environment where the internal and the external bits of knowledge are getting constantly updated. Down the bottom there is a, is a, a, a piece of insight which I'm going to pull out here. So he said, each organizational unit is continuously analyzing, digesting, integrating, collaborating, developing, applying, and reusing its knowledge, which is ingested from its external environment. This is 1968. In addition, he talked about what this collaborative world, one of the prerequisites, he listed a number of prerequisites for this, for this collaborative world where people were, were, were working together and shared knowledge. And one of the key uh, aspects of this was a common vocabulary. He called it a common vocabulary. Vocabulary is a word that's gone out of fashion, but um, uh, there are lots of similar things I'll come back to that, that, that fit well together with this collaborative, uh, this common vocabulary idea. Uh, you can't read that, but if, uh, th there's a reference there to this paper, um, mm -hmm. and it's published. Doug, Doug Elbert was writing this when he was at SRI, just down the road. So the problem with this, this is this was great, uh, uh, you know, a great insight. It actually, even even in Doug Engelbart's work, it never came to fruition. He got distracted by mice and various other things, um, but. Um, when you look back and think that was uh, so long ago, what have we done since then? It's astonishing how little we've actually achieved in, in those goals. All those goals seem to me to be just as relevant now as they were then. The boxes have changed, perhaps some of the names. The, what we mean by the outside world may have changed, but the, those models can be applied exactly to uh, the environment that I think we're all in now. So. It's a bit, in one sense, a bit sobering to look back and think uh, that these insights have been around so long, uh, we haven't got very far with them. So knowledge and, and, and even just shared vocabularies, just you know, the idea of, of a, a marketing department or an engineering department sharing knowledge is something which is extremely rare, even 40 years later. So what I want to talk about is uh, the way in which the games are changing now and in the way in which this challenge of sharing knowledge inside the enterprise and with customers uh, is something which is um, becoming more pressing imperative. So all of a sudden in the last couple of years, uh, some people might even say less than that, I think although obviously social media and, and, and the community and these concepts have been around for longer than that, they didn't really hit the enterprise until fairly recently. Uh, you heard Bill talking this morning about how they, at some point, suddenly realized it was relevant even for IBM. But it took a while for these things to get relevant for the enterprise, but um, they are undoubtedly now relevant for every single company. I'll try and talk a little bit about why that's, why that's the case. So, the external bit that Doug Engelbart was talking about was really, is really becoming even more critical in the process of having the right knowledge and making that available to the right people. So, sorry, that's a bit washed out on here. Um, the top thing says communities, the bottom thing says content. Um, there are new content life cycles developing, whereby content gets created by <coughs> enterprises, and um, uh, you heard Aaron talking about this uh, earlier on this afternoon. Um, the, the, it then gets out into the wild, so to speak, and goes out into, into communities. The communities talk. They, they take that knowledge up and work with it do whatever they like with it, they're not playing by your rules, they're playing by their own rules. And then somehow you want that knowledge to be uh, the arrow on the right hand side, you want that knowledge to flow back into the company, to be able to do something with it so that you can also make use of that knowledge. Also because you want to make use, you want to make that knowledge available to your, back to your customers. So there's a um, 
there's a relationship going on, which two or three years ago was just non-existent. It was a one-way street. Company creates knowledge, pumps it out, shouts very loud at the customers, and the customers just uh, receive it and and uh, think about it. So that's a that that's one of the aspects of the revolution. That this is a fundamental, game-changing event. That all of a sudden. Uh, you can't. You can no longer talk about controlling the controlling your messaging or controlling uh, customer communications, customer um, uh, engagement. You have to talk about nurturing it or influencing it or trying to trying to optimize it in, in, by, by by trying to make things happen rather than just um, decreeing that they will be that they will happen. So, um, another aspect of this, and I think channels are overstated, so Twitter and, and Facebook and all these new channels that, that are available are not, fun, are not in my view, uh, they create a, a, a more efficient network that means information moves faster, but um, they don't fundamentally change what you're trying to do. What you're trying to do is to communicate across uh, whichever channels you have. People have always had a multi-channel, not always, but people have had a multi-channel uh, communication possibilities for 20 years. Um, uh, the channels change regularly as technology changes, but the principle of having a multi-channel strategy hasn't changed much. What has changed is that this making this cohesive has become much harder. So as the uh, as the network gets more efficient, as the community gets, a, gets its rights on its own, um, the, then, then making that cohesive, making the customer's experience of all the knowledge that exists around your products becomes much harder. I'm just going to skip on. So, um, Significant in the one significant aspect of, of, of this is really to think about the amount of content that's involved. So um, there have been a number of studies on the amount of, of simply the, the amount of content that, that's out there relating to any specific product or any specific um, company's activities. And the numbers are, I, I think, tend to be exaggerated, but you hear anything from like uh, 100. Well, 30 times to 300 times the numbers that I've that I've collected. Um, but what's clear is that there is a there is a many times uh, more content generated by users inside product forums and uh, uh, platforms that are supported, sponsored in some way by the company. And then outside that, there's even more content that's generated independently of the company. So, third-party blogs and reviews and and other content. This content, the, the blue and the, the green element, far outweighs the enterprise content that you can create. You'll never, you'll never be able to generate any more, more content or overwhelming content compared to the content that the customers generate, unless you have no customers, which will happen if you ignore all this stuff. So the, enter, the enterprise content really takes on a different status. It becomes a seed with which you can plant your message, your, your traditions, what, how you want to communicate your product, how you would like your product to be seen. And it gives you the opportunity to, to influence what happens later, but you don't control it. And we've talked a lot about content, but one important aspect of I mean, one thing that's increasingly forgotten in when people talk about content is that content's made up of words. And I'll come back to all the different ways in which people talk about words. But words are, or otherwise known as language, collection of words, um, are, the, are the key to making content work. Content is not a black box. In the, the old days, well, in the, the last century, when people talked about knowledge, knowledge management systems, they were basically talking about shoveling Word documents as black boxes from one place to another, maybe making them searchable by the date they were created or the person who claimed to be the author. But 
Um, that's not really knowledge management. Knowledge management only happens when you start to get hold of the content and start to be able to get linguistic insights on the content. If you have content created across the organization in different groups, perhaps they're sharing knowledge according to the, 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 um, the picture Doug, Doug Engelbart had a few, uh, a few slides ago, but it's, that, I said is, as I said, is unusual. It's very unlikely that you'll be able to get consistency across, or it's unusual right now to have consistency across those different pieces of content that get created. We're at the Worldware Conference. The con customers are all around the world for most, for most companies nowadays. Uh, very few companies have, only have customers in one country. Even if they're in one country, it's unlikely they'll all speak the same language. So if you're creating content, can they, um, can they find you? If they find you, can they understand what you say to them when they find you? And what are they saying about you? As things change over time, as uh, your product is on the market, you have customers and they're talking to each other, there's a conversation going on. Information changes, there's a conversation between customers. And there's a conversation maybe that you want to have with your customers. <clears throat> it's no longer, a, as I said, no longer a one-way street. It should be a dialogue. So how does that work? All of these critical, strategic things you want to be doing are mediated by language, by words. <clears throat> Let's think about the simple case of finding information about your products or finding your products. Someone is now looking for a product. In principle, they could type in the URL in the browser that, that would point to your product. And then they would land there and then they would buy it. More likely, a little bit more likely, is that they go to the website because they've heard you make a product and they try and then navigate to your product. Perhaps if the navigation doesn't immediately, isn't immediately obvious, they would use the website's internal search feature to find, try and find the product that they're looking for, etc. There are a number of other things they might do. They might follow a link that they see that goes there or, or whatever. Increasingly, more likely is to ask a friend, uh, either a real friend or a virtual friend in some social network, or a real friend in a social network, um, they might also use a search engine directly without worrying about you in any way. Just, I'm interested in this product. What does the web say about this product? And there are some numbers, and these are changing very quickly, but a, a relatively outdated no number uh, from a couple of, well, from a year and a half ago or so is. Um, that around a quarter of all product searches lead to user-generated content. This number is going up rapidly. Scott Abel posted an article today, or a tweet to a reference to an article today, pointing out, this I think was uh, published by eMarketeer today, um, about the role of trust in product search. So, um, you probably can't read that. I can't even read it. 30% of um, customers making purchase decisions, buyers making purchasing decisions, 30% of those were using user reviews through social media to influence their, their purchase decisions. 17% using Facebook, 14% using video, etc. So, it's becoming increasingly hard to sell product, even. Never mind engage with the customer, make them happy, and, and uh, make sure that you continue to develop good products. But even to sell a first product to a customer is becoming increasingly hard without a social media presence of some kind, without your ability to um, to get your message across in these environments. 
So this is, if you like, the pre-sales experience. Looking at the, the post-sales experience, I'm sorry, this is a bit washed out as well. But, um, so this is an example of what Symantec has seen over the last few years um, in terms of their support environment. And you don't need to read these at the back. All you need to look at is the, how much more blue there is in the, uh, the second and third um, pie charts. The blue part is community activity. So the red thing, they started out in 2000, the end of 2007, with a lot of self-service activity. So Symantec's been at the forefront of promoting self-service as a way of keeping customers happy. Um, and this is, this is not just about um, getting rid of the work. A customer who can get self-service is actually happier because they get their, they get their answers faster. So there's been num numbers of studies on, on how customers that can, that can get answers directly uh, are, are happy. And it's obviously very intuitive that the faster you get your answer, the happier you'll be. But what is, what is impressive is it, this is in a 12-month period from 07, September 07 to September 08. Number of interactions has, uh, has almost tripled. And the number of um, community activity uh, interactions has gone up by from 2% to 60%. And has continued to increase. I don't know what the numbers are this year, um, but the, I know that the tendency is increasing. So, both on a pre-sales, for pre-sales experience uh, of the, for the customer, and the post-sales experience, um, the interaction with the community, and the interaction with trusted peers, is critical for uh, you, the way you interact with the customer. Well, that's perhaps an exaggeration. It's critical for the customer buying and remaining happy. So, um, this is, if you like, a rehash of the, of the Engelbart picture of the different pieces of knowledge, the different pieces of um, product information that, that are out there, that people have created. Um, I doubt in 2011 that the technical documentation cog would be quite that big. I suspect it would be one of the smaller cogs. Um, uh, the knowledge base, I don't know if you probably can't read these either, but this says um, maybe regulatory information, the support and knowledge bases, marketing and pre sales. There's a lot of product inf information in the product, there's training material, there's technical documentation. Connecting these things is a key challenge in uh, making a consistent customer experience. A lot of people say to me that um, you know, they're moving to a uh, multimedia strategy with more video and um, <coughs> getting rid of, people don't read stuff anymore, so it's all show and tell and how do we do that. As we're moving away from that way, of, uh, from the text way of provisioning information, you might think that, that words will become less important. But in fact, words become more important because they're one of the only keys that you have to finding this information. So um, there's more information out there than ever before. Um, I don't know, Google have talked about the numbers. I can't remember exactly what it is, but we're now creating more information in every nine months than we've ever, than the whole of civilization has ever created. Um, which is a bit misleading because a lot of that counts the video content that is naturally bigger. Um, but this is an example of trying to use YouTube without any words in it. And um, uh, this is, uh, it quite shows that although you have all this content available, there's no way of using that content unless you, um, sorry, I should have attributed this. This is not from me. This is, uh, if you look for YouTube UI with no text, you'll find the original, uh, the original blog that this came from. Scott, do you happen to know where it? Tom Johnson. Okay. So, um, uh, 
the fact is you can't use any of these interfaces, you can't get access to any of this content without the words that go around it. Keywords, indexes, whatever you want to call it, it's all just words, it's language. And um, getting back to the words and managing the words is a, is a key part of that. Now as soon as we talk about words and language, and we've heard a lot of that, a lot of this obviously already today, um, there are, there's more, there are more languages than just English out there. So if you talk to people about search, indexing, 99% um, of the effort go, the companies are investing in search and SEO and, and uh, improving the way they, they deliver content is focused around English content. But that's less than half of typical companies global company's revenue, and it's certainly the half that's growing the slowest. Um, there was an article in The Economist about um, Caterpillar's growth, which is currently over twice as fast in, um, uh, in Latin America than it is in North America, for example. But this is not to say that this is a translation challenge, because this is actually nothing about translation. I'm, I'm, the, the translation challenge is kind of running alongside this, but this is nothing directly to do with translation. The challenge here is not so much about translation, but about search. It's about making content available. The language barrier is one of the barriers, but it's basically just how do you make the information that is out there, community content, any other kind of content, how do you, your own content, how do you make that available to people? And the, the answer is through search, but obviously that search has to be working for you. So you can think of another life cycle, which is over here on the left, where in principle, well, in fact, this, this, is, this, this doesn't really start here, but I'll just pretend we start here with product marketing. So, I'm the product marketeer, I think up some product, and it's, it's a wonderful product, I know exactly what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to work out all my messaging and all my branding and all my, my key differentiators, the things that, I, that make this product special. And I'm going to go out there, I'm going to, I'm going to put them together, I'm going to manage them because I want to be sure that that's what, how I communicate uh, about this great new product. Once, I, once I've got those down somewhere, I can then deploy those to make sure that when I, when I create content, it's going to be, it's going to be aligned with those, with those trending topics, those keywords, those, uh, um, that shared vocabulary that I want to have across all the, the, the customer communication that I want to create. Then that information goes out into the wild. It gets released, published, uh, and things start to happen. Content gets created around that content. It gets picked up and written about. My press releases about the product get picked up and written about. What I now need to do is to analyze what ha what's happening. I need to be in a process of, of basically um, looking at what, what is going on around that content. So for a while I was calling this text content-aware web analytics. You might, also, you might also hear it called text analytics, although I think that's a broader concept. But web analytics right now is, is again, like, content, like knowledge management was in, in, in the 20th century, is, is, is black box stuff. It's not looking at the content. It's looking at clicks and, and where you come from, where you go to, and um, it's not so much looking at the actual <coughs> content. So, if you're looking at user-generated content, or you're taking user-generated content seriously, you need to get your hands on that content. And getting your hands on it means language. It means looking at the words and looking at the language and under trying to understand things about that. If you understand something about that with your analytics, then what you would love to be able to do is to take those insights that you gain from understanding and being in being engaged with your customers and being in dialogue with your customers, to take those insights and to feed them back into product marketing. Maybe even product management, but then I'm really dreaming. <laughs> but you could imagine that um, 
you can learn things, make the product better. If the product isn't better, at least you can communicate it better as to how it works or uh, how it's supposed to work. Right now, um, lots of people are doing SEO. They're um, creating content, throwing it over the wall, publishing it, and then they're analyzing what's happening out there and collecting keywords. The clue is in the, the word words. Uh, so these are just words, actually. They're the same kinds of words that everyone else is looking at. But if you call them terminology or if you call them shared vocabulary, the SEO people will look at you like, that what that's something different. We don't do that. But it's all the same thing. Trending topics is the same as keywords. It's the same as um, very often the same as branding, the same as messaging. It's the same thing that you're trying to do. But SEO right now is reactive, almost exclusively reactive. So you throw some content out and then you look at how people interact with that content. And what are they looking for? How can we, how can we, and then you end up adding meta tags or, or faking content, getting content regenerated and Google site to penalize this, but people have been generating content simply for the purpose of getting traffic back to where they want it to go to. So wouldn't it be nice instead of having this reactive approach to search to be able to be more proactive about it? So keyword management, in principle, is going to be a kind of what we call in the, in the old-fashioned view of words and those kinds of things, terminology management. In principle, if one had a terminology management tool, one could also manage search terms. One could also manage trending topics, all from within one space of shared enterprise knowledge. I'm going to come to this discover, validate, deploy thing in a second. Um, getting analytics to some extent is simply then a matter of taking those terms. This is something that I did um, on the Oracle uh, forums, was to look at the key trending topics in, an or in the Oracle forums. So obviously Oracle comes up a lot, discussion forums comes up a lot. Um, Specific products come up a lot, analyst reports, things like that. Here we have simply a list of trending topics. I can decide which ones I want to manage. I can look at the frequency of those on <coughs> a specific URL, either my URL or my competitor's URL, um, and start to collect insights. Using that same raw material, raw data that I've generated, I can then do things like this. This is just eye candy. This is generated by the IBM Many Eyes. It's open source stuff, not from us. Uh, but you can already see how having the raw material, the intelligent content analytics, uh, gives you the ability to then start to do, to generate real instant insights. You can look at this for two seconds and you can know that this company, for, for instance, is interested in <coughs> Arabic, which is a surprising thing you might not have known about. The fact that these are orange rather than blue means they're coming up rather than going down. So blue is, blue is less frequent than it was last week. Uh, orange is more frequent. So all of a sudden Arabic has come up in relevance for some reason. I don't know why. Similarly, you'll see virtualization and um, <coughs> cloud computing. How could I miss that? These are big topics, but they're stable or maybe even becoming less uh, hot than they were. Mid-sized companies. So already you can see that as a, you can start to gain insights into, into that simply on the basis of the words, or words and phrases. Uh, you can do this across languages. So you can do this for, even if you're sitting in San Jose, Santa Clara, you can already um, start to see what, what, are the, what are our Chinese customers or our Japanese customers talking about. What are the most interesting things for them? You can do this on your competitor's site. So I actually ran this same analysis over uh, the IBM database website 
and the uh, Microsoft part of the uh, database website. And you can already see mismatches in the way they talk about content. Some of these mismatches, perhaps the wrong word, differences in focus that those different companies have. Interestingly, you can also see that um, whilst both Microsoft and IBM mentioned Oracle, Oracle didn't mention either IBM or Microsoft. So, the, <coughs> I hope this gives you some impression as how you can go from, uh, from analysis to insight, which I think is the key part of um, being able to, to, to use this process uh, for something useful. Think of it in terms of SEO. I apologize if this isn't this isn't legible either. Um, I should pull this out, but I, I wanted to have several several um, several examples of this. What you'll see here is that the trending topics that I'm interested in optimizing my search on, I can automatically pull out uh, German in this case German keywords uh, to to feed the search process cross lingually. So now I'm not translating the whole topic that I'm going to give you, but at least I'm going to give you the right topic. If you're searching for uh, Medienkarten Lesegerät in German, you're at least, <coughs> at least going to give you the media car reader topics. And you can, you can translate them on demand if you like, or you can try and read the English. Uh, there are a number of different options. But if I don't have any translated content, at least I can give you the right English content. So. As I said, it's not, about, not so much about translation, it's about delivering the right information at the right time. And uh, obviously, Chinese, Russian, whatever you want to, to think about. Um, there's been a lot of talk about semantic search. There are whole conferences about the semantic web and, and the way these things are going. I, I, a lot of people ask me when I talk about knowledge and sharing knowledge and, and, and gaining knowledge and giving out knowledge. Uh, a lot of people ask about how this fits together with the semantic web. And um, I think the answer is really that, that this is what we're seeing now, what we can do right now today is one small baby step towards a semantic web. The semantic web is in terms of large large practical applications in terms of something which is agile enough to deal with the fast changing world of the of the user generated content where articles created at a speed that 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 is uh, that defies um, kind of complex annotations where you can't expect user gener users generating content to create rich annotations in that kind of world uh, right now the the kinds of keyword analysis, the kind of analysis uh, on the front end promoting search, constructing relations between keywords is a, uh, is a little baby step towards the semantic revolution. I think a lot of people think that suddenly the semantic web is going to be there. I think that's not the way it's going to happen. What's more likely is that the semantic web will come in lots of little increments. And, um, I think what we're doing now, what we're seeing now, our customers doing, is is a very uh, confident step in this direction. Another aspect of this whole gaining insights business is that, and this is there are, not everyone agrees on this, but there are people who claim that it would be interesting to know what people are saying about my keywords. So if I identify, um, if I'm a camera manufacturer and I say autofocus is one of my keywords that I'm interested in, um, do people like the autofocus on my camera or not? If I bring out a new model with a new autofocus feature, do they like it or not? Now, if you talk to people at Google, they'll say, this doesn't matter. Everybody, all we want to know is whether people are talking about it or not. If they're talking about it a lot, then that's interesting, and that's all you need to know. Either it's, because you know ultimately whether it's good or bad, and you can find out the rest yourself. 
I don't necessarily agree with that. I can see some cases where that's true, but I think in the enterprise space, context is important. And being able to gain not, not insights into precise things, but tendencies about whether people are generally happy or generally unhappy about your products is something which we can capture very effectively with, with linguistic analysis. And we can do it multilingually. And we can provide genuine insights of a, of a higher level, of, a, of another dimension than simply counting the keywords and, and, and giving you those numbers. <coughs> So what does this look like in practice? Well, um, to come back to the, to the keyword part of this, I think um, keywords in the broadest possible sense, so the words that we're using. I think there are a number of things that uh, companies are, are defining in different spaces in the organization, typically not connected, but I would argue they need to be connected, in terms of of the words that are important to those. They would be things like the branding and differentiators that I've mentioned, obviously product names, not trivial uh, in many cases. For technical precision, for liability, for, 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 um, for other, other <coughs> things around those kinds of things, for support and, uh, and other areas, you want to have some kind of technical precision guarantee. We talked already about tone of voice and the way in which you communicate with your customers. A, a games manufacturer will communicate differently to someone uh, to, with their customers than someone creating uh, um, yeah, an aircraft. Search optimization I've also talked about. Uh, this, is, this, this could be something you can plan. You can build a strategy around. You can connect your branding and your differentiators with your search optimization plans. And all of those things need to be global ready. They need to be the language dimension, the multilingual dimension needs to go on top of those as an, as an overlay. Many companies do all that stuff. They have maybe not connected the different bits of common, different bits of vocabulary, but they've all built vocabularies. It's not yet a common vocabulary, but it's, at least they have vocabularies. What they're typically not doing is deploying that. When I say deploying, what I mean is make sure that when you create content that you use that common vocabulary in that content. And to some extent, little, pe little groups of people are doing this. Maybe the SEO people, that I know that I've seen training material that companies are using to try and make their writers more SEO aware. Um, so they're at least doing that, but they're not connecting that with the messaging. They're not connecting that with the global readiness. So everything has to work at once. Whenever content gets created, uh, you need to be applying these, uh, this strategy. Another key aspect, of course, is to know where you are with these things. Without metrics and reporting, without being able to see where you are with, with these, um, uh, with, with meeting your targets or meeting your goals, especially when you're not generating all the content, when maybe 300 times that content that you've created is created by other people, then metrics and reporting analytics become a critical part of your, your arsenal in in, um, in, in understanding what your content, what the customers are getting from, uh, are seeing as content around your products. Um, I actually already talked about this, but the, the, the key part of, of delivering this stuff is really to focus on high quality content. So we as I mentioned, we've already seen that Google is starting to penalize content created and content farms specifically written uh, with um, that to be low on actual content, to be, to be high on SEO uh, score. And um, the more that happens, the more companies will be forced to 
deliver high quality content to get the search. Uh, the, the, the old days of just sticking keywords in the, in, a, in the right meta tag have long gone, but people still, people are, are right now starting to get the effects of adding, simply adding keywords into content without making the content uh, more effective. <coughs> And, and the search engine people are starting to get wise to that, starting to penalize content that is specifically written for search. So high quality content is going to become important. And even without the, this constant battle between the people creating content and the people ranking it for search, generally high quality content is important. Uh, customers will value high quality content over uh, blatant advertising content, they will trust content uh, that is well written, they'll trust content in their own language, they'll trust content that comes from uh, respected members of the community. Um, and so lots of quality metrics need to apply in order to get, um, to, to get the content to be, uh, to be working for you. So just um, to give you some idea about why all this might be important, the, obviously everyone likes to have effective content, everyone likes to be loved, but um, this really matters in, in, in making you an effective company. I often hear that creating product information is a is a burden on the company, it's something that people do but they wish they didn't have to do and you often pe hear people apologizing that they have to write this stuff, never mind translate it. The translators often feel even more guilty that they're a burden on the company. Increasingly people are starting to realize that, um, and we had this conversation last night uh, with Nico talking about um, he was presenting it to his board, uh, a new language was a new market. And it's blatantly obvious, we heard it also this morning, but uh, opening, making your information more available, whether it's the language barrier or whether it's by improving search or whether it's by engaging customers effectively, drives revenue, sells more product. It's as simple as that. So you're driving, driving more revenue through better customer, customer engagement and Looking to the future, it allows you to deliver better product focus by a clear understanding of what the customer is thinking. So those two aspects are, are critical for the future of the company as well as the bottom line today. <coughs> These were some additional benefits that were highlighted in a survey by, by Jive Software who make uh, forums. I'm sure they would describe it as otherwise, but they, it's one of the things they claim they do. There are some soft benefits like more communication with customers, so 42% more communication with customers. But there are some very hard benefits, concrete benefits. 28% decrease in support call volumes through increased use of, of social media and engaging with customers effectively. 31% increase in customer retention. If you're moving towards a subscription <coughs> model for your product, then customer retention becomes the ultimate metric you're interested in. Because you're not selling any new products, you're just you're selling a small subscription and buying confidence for the future. 34% more feedback and ideas from customers. So insights, looking at social media and making your products better. And softer things like uh, higher brand awareness. Oh, and I nearly forgot. 27% increase in new customer sales. So this was one company's survey of the benefits that uh, a wide range of different companies had from having an effective social media strategy. Um, this is my last, second to last slide. So, what does this deliver? If, if you can enable a 
an enterprise content strategy that includes the company itself and the company's customers. You can coordinate global messaging and branding, global messaging, you can do that across all your customer base. You can ensure messaging across and between and with whatever else you like to have as prepositions. The content creation team, so um, really get them working together instead of independently of each other, which ha tends to happen now. You can provide actionable analytics. So analytics that you can actually use to do something. Uh, hopefully doing something means making the product better and not so bad. And you can employ, or you can empower the deployment of, of not just of SEO, but of an SEO strategy. So you can plan how you want to do SEO. What does SEO mean for us? And having planned it, you can then deploy that plan. You can, you can make that happen. So um, connecting marketing, engineering, technical publications, if they still exist, support into one user experience and engage with your customers and tailor your content to them. Or your content, not really your content, content to them. Before I go to questions, and I think we've already heard a little bit about this, but I just wanted to, while I've got your attention, to <coughs> mention Translators Without Borders. Communication can also save lives. So there are many people um, right now in Japan who are getting help from the international community. The international community doesn't all speak Japanese. Translation is a key part of um, making those aid efforts um, work effectively. And Translators Without Borders, um, I'm sure you can manage to find their website, uh, is a, um, an organization that's helping um, make that information available to people across the language barrier. So, shameless plug, I'm sorry about that. Um, questions? Comments? So I've got a couple of questions. So, This one? Does this one try happen? this again. Okay. Um, how does one measure ROI of doing all this work? So, well, there are, there, are, there are some soft, I mean, as I said, there are some soft benefits and some hard benefits. So there's some, there's some things that you can measure quite a long way down the line uh, when you've been doing this for a while. You can see these kinds of effects appearing in terms of ROI. But there are also some um, some benefits that you can have on the way. So you can, it, it, it's possible to, to already measure how much more efficient you are at, at, at even achieving intermediate goals. So editing, perform, typically the time that you, that you need to, if, you, if you're clear about your goals, um, then the time that you have to, to write to those goals is, 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 um, is reduced. The sharing of knowledge between organizations leads to increases in leverage in translations and, 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 uh, and other spaces. The money people are spending on paid search as opposed to organic search is a direct reflection of their, um, of, well, partially a, a, a direct reflection of uh, their, the, the, the fact that, search isn't, that organic search is not working for them. So companies typically spend a lot on on paid search when um, they're, they're trying to cheat the system effectively to some extent, even if it's only for a short time. So there are a number of short-term tactical ROI uh, points you can see inside the company, so to speak. We want to get from here to here. And then there are some of these longer-term benefits that come over time that, that you can expect if you're typical with the people that, that, that have been surveyed here, for example. So, um, yeah, a combination of those things. Any questions from the audience? I'd love to get that link working, the Jive software link for the source. Does it not work? It's a, it's a, I shortened it. 
Yeah, I'm getting a giant puffer fish when I type it in. <clears throat> it's not that old. It's bit.ly e l m six n l. Yeah. yeah. Bitly's down. Yeah, could be. I've got the cute little bitly fish though. The puffer I can fish get you that says like. Uh, yeah. I can find you. There's okay. another question over Scott, here. Scott, did you have a question? Yeah, I'm just curious. Um, if you think that um, documentation <laughs> needs to be socially enabled. That's a loaded question. Well, of course. But do you it's a, or? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, you I do. me or Aaron? I'm, I'm a, <laughs> well, I'm asking you too because I think um, a lot of people wonder why it should be. And I, and I think you started off with this revolution, you know, yeah. as your concept. Uh, uh, I, to, I mean, the, it depends what you mean by documentation. I think I know what you mean by documentation, but um, yeah, I, I think uh, there's been a progression in the last 10 years or so away from books and CDs and stuff and, and towards uh, more task-oriented uh, writing about, about products. Um, so it, the, everyone's trying to focus on what are you trying to achieve. If I can find out what you're trying to achieve, then here is, here's a little topic. Here's exactly the little bit of information that you need to do that. Um, but of course, I don't know who you are. I don't know what you know. I don't know what you might already have seen from somewhere else. What you might what you might have available in your in your network of of people. So if I don't make if I don't connect that to what I know about you, if I don't make the, the content socially aware, then I'm losing a whole dimension of, of, of stuff that I can leverage to, to make you happier faster. And so I think um, there, there's enormous potential to, to making uh, any kind of product information socially aware uh, because people have networks and, and you know, if you don't, if you're not making it available, if you're not attaching it to the network in some way, uh, there are various ways of doing it, then, then uh, you're missing a treat. You're really, it's uh, it, it, it's going to be far less effective. Well, do you think when, when we try to sell these ideas, maybe we should try to borrow from the ideas we use to sell software? So, for example, we always sell ROI to customers when we try to sell software to them. I wonder if we should sell personal ROI. We should understand what it's like to be a consumer. And instead of wasting time creating documentation, I'm wasting time looking for yours, yeah, or absolutely. looking for French, or trying to solve a problem, or whatever. And so my my opportunity cost is, um, you know, that I could spend a lot of time on your stuff, or I could go someplace else. Absolutely, and and there are there's apocryphal evidence that that has enormous effect on customer engagement. So companies, uh, customers are reporting, uh, bloggers are reporting that. Uh, especially in foreign languages, that the, the, their ability to get access to the right content quickly, especially across the language barrier, is a key part of the customer customer satisfaction, customer engagement. They don't uh, nowadays they don't have high expectations about the translated content. They expect right. the, the marketing stuff and, the, and the, the high value content to be translated, but they don't expect uh, forum content, or, or they, don't, they don't have high expectations. That what they do expect is that you will help them find the right bit of user-generated content to get their problem solved. Unless you're Apple, in which case you can just say, there's so many people writing about us that we don't really uh, you know, <laughs> go over there and find it. Uh, we, it's hands off. Although they do a good job of their small amount of content they create. That's more of a kind of dual approach. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions from the audience? I have another one. So do, uh, do content cycles integrating uh, feedback from external sources ever have negative impacts or significantly unexpected impacts in, on companies? Do um, you describe the feedback mechanism, uh, product marketing, launches the product, <coughs> the community, they write about an idea like that back to product marketing and potentially product management. And do these content cycles um, sometimes have unexpected or negative impacts? Yeah, I think I think they, they can do. Um, speaking partly from personal experience uh, uh, building a product, um, but also you know, the, the more agile you are, there's a danger that you can end up... I mean, you still need strong product management. You still need people in the company who have a vision, who uh, 
uh, will execute on that vision. The question is, can you, can you influence those? Can the customers influence those people um, and, and help them have the right information to make the right decisions? But it's not like uh, it would be like a voting mechanism which would uh, allow the community to take the product if it felt like it to take the product in a different direction than the company wanted to go. I still think there's a strong role for uh, successful companies will be those that act on those insights but aren't driven by them, um, that are influenced by them but not dominated by them. So, yeah, obviously there could be cases where uh, I don't have any, any anecdotes to tell, but I, at least none that I can repeat. Uh, but there are case, you know, we've had cases where um, a, a feature has got a long way towards getting it into the product by customer demand or by you know, uh, customer feedback until uh, suddenly we realize that that's not aligned with our, with our strategic goals. So um, I imagine that it would be easy enough for that to happen. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you.